Um, we know that more folks will join us, but um, yeah, let's let's get going. We have a, a great meeting today. We're really excited about it. So um, let me move the slides and show you the agenda. So we'll start this morning as we always do with some introductions so that we know um, one another as best we can in this virtual platform. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some um, uh, medical home portal updates and anything else that is of interest. Um, we're delighted to have a few minutes to give to you all for any of your um, cases that you'd like to share and talk about, um, any new resources you may have come across, any updates on cases, we love those, um, any QI that you might be doing in your, in your practice. Um, for yourself, <laughs> any motivational interviewing opportunities. Uh, and of course, that's our main topic today. So we're really excited about that. Um, any of those kinds of things. And we love it when you you utilize that time and, and take advantage of this group and their wealth of experience and knowledge. And then we're really looking forward to having um, a couple of residents from the University School of Medicine, uh, triple board residents, as it were, in pediatrics, um, adult psychiatry, and child and adolescent psychiatry who are skilled in motivational interviewing, and they'll be working with us today. I think they're going to pop on probably pretty close to 9 a.m., and then we'll wrap it up by 10. So with that, let's go ahead and start with our uh, introductions. So I think everybody knows me. I am Mindy Tuller. Uh, I am the Director of Operations for the Medical Home Portal. I facilitate this meeting and I've done that for eight years now. Um, and it means a lot to me. I really enjoy working with you all and spending this time with you on a monthly basis. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that's me. And then let's go ahead and I'll just go down the list of participants as I see them. Um, so next I see Michelle. Michelle, you wanna introduce yourself? Yes, good morning. I'm Michelle Redfield. I'm the Administrative Assistant for uh, Medical Home Portal, UCCCN, and General Pediatrics. Thank you. Um, Amy Boyd. Hi, I am a QI specialist for the University Department of Pediatrics. I am over the Aspire Project, um, also the mother of two autistic kiddos, and a certified medical assistant as well. Fantastic. So glad to have you, Amy. And then another Amy, Amy Nance. And if you're not able to um, unmute and speak, that is no problem whatsoever. If you're able to use the chat, that works, and we will read out what you have to say. Um, let's see if I can see what's happening with Amy. Amy is, uh, Eric, do you want to explain Amy's role? Uh, yes, Amy is our new office director um, with the Department of Health and Human Services. She's over the Office of Children with Special Health Care Needs and fills the role that Noelle Taxon uh, formerly held. Noelle has moved into uh, the role of division director uh, for family health. Thanks, Eric. We, we so appreciate Amy for taking the time to be on these meetings. Um, really appreciate that. And Eric, why don't you just go ahead and introduce yourself? Okay, I'm Eric Christensen. I'm a program manager uh, with Integrated Services at uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Great, thank you. All right, um, Ashley Donham. Hi, I'm Ashley Donham. I'm with the uh, Utah Department of Health and Human Services Office of Substance Use and Mental Health. And I oversee IDD, Intellectual and Developmental Disability, and Mental Health Services. Fantastic. We really appreciate you being here. Athena. Hi, I'm Athena Parker. I'm the Support Services Manager with the Medical Home Portal. Great. Um, Daniela. Sorry, I'm just having issues with the unmute button. <laughs> Hi, I'm Daniela. I am um, the with care management, the patient care coordinator at, at University Pediatrics at the main hospital. So glad you're with us. Uh, Dora. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dora. I am the professional relations coordinator for Shriners Children's in Salt Lake City. And my role is to inform the clinics of what the resources are for your patients. So. Thank you. 
Thanks, Dora. We always love having Shriners with us. Um, Erica Wall. Hi, I'm Erica Wall. I am with Integrated Services, Eric's team, and I cover the Duchesne Daggett and Uinta counties. So glad you're with us this morning. Heidi Bates. Hey, it's Heidi. I work, I'm one of the QI specialists uh, for UPIC. Glad you're here. Good morning. Uh, Ileana. Hello, this is Ileana. I work at Southwest Children's Clinic and I'm the manager over the clinic. Wonderful. Are you, is it just you today on your connection? Well, I'm driving in, so I'm on my cell, so I don't know if Janet's um, in the building in another computer or not, but um, as soon as I get in, then I'll go on a computer. <laughs> okay, sounds great. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Julie Southwick. Hi, I'm Julie Southwick. I am on Eric's team as a transition specialist, and I also am a health educator with the Utah Birth Tech Network. Wonderful, glad you're with us. Monica Wimberly. Hello, I am um, one of the nurse care managers at the Sugar House Clinic with the university and I'm gonna be helping cover family medicine and pediatrics. Oh, fantastic. Okay, glad you're with us, Monica. Thank you. Natalie Carter. Hi, I'm Natalie Carter. I'm with Eric Christensen's team. Um, and I'm also a, a public health nurse in the central Utah area. Excellent. Really happy you're here. Thank you. Walt Torres. Good morning. I'm Walt with Integrated Services Program in the Salt Lake office uh, with Eric's team also, and I'm a care coordinator. Good morning, Walt. Uh, and Whitney Davidson. Whitney, if you have a chance, please just let us know who you are. That's no problem, though. And um, that looks like who we have on so far. And we'll go ahead and get going. Oh, I see something in the chat. She doesn't have her microphone. Uh, Whitney is a pediatric nurse with Utah Valley Pediatrics, and she's a care coordinator. Care coordinator. Wonderful. So glad you're with us this morning, Whitney. All right. So, um, yeah, we, we know all about... Um, technology and Zoom meetings and all of that. So uh, we're just glad you're with us. But if you have the opportunity to be on a, on a laptop or a desktop, um, it, it does seem like there's a little bit more robust experience. But uh, any way you can join us is fantastic. We will do our best to end promptly at 10 a.m. and respect your time. Just want to remind you about the Spark Autism Study. It is um, an ongoing study. And um, Amy Boyd, do you want to say anything about this um, or, or Heidi? Putting you on the spot. Sorry about that. Oh, <laughs> it's fine. I can talk to it. I've been I've been part of this uh, Spark for Autism study for about well about four years now. So um, it's not just so you know it's not going away. It's uh, it's we're universities one of um, a few across the nation um, that that uh, is partnered with Simmons to do this. Um, so yeah, I think. Um, and, and again, if you need any questions or brochures, we can definitely get that to you. Also, just so you know, we just got approved to be a pilot site for Spanish Spark. So before it was just um, people that could, uh, or, you know, individuals that could read English, speak English. Um, and now we, they have expanded it to Spanish. So it took them a little while, took them a hot minute, but um, just to further that, or I guess to like narrow that gap um, for, uh, people that have autism and their parents. Um, there's some great webinars coming up. Um, when you, when you sign up for spark, uh, you, it's not just, you know, it's not just like you swab and you go, it's, you will be signed up for there's monthly webinars, there's newsletters, there's, um, they just did one with autism and puberty. Um, they're doing one coming up this week or this month. I'll have to look at it and I can forward it to Mindy, but it's, um, it's really great stuff. Wonderful. That's that's a good reminder. Um, I think we may have known about the the expansion to Spanish speaking 
families um, last month, but I didn't remember. So I'm glad you brought that up and we'll update this slide so that that information is included. Yeah. And, and just so you know, if you guys want Spanish uh, brochures, we just got them printed um, and I'm picking them up today. So let me know and I can drop them off. Perfect. Thank you, Heidi. All right. So a few uh, updates on our medical home portal website um, with clinical content. Uh, our childhood abs absence epilepsy um, diagnosis module has been updated, as has one of our newborn screening pages for CPT1 deficiency. I could not say that full title, so I'm going to keep it uh, abbreviated. And then our postpartum depression screening um, has just been updated as well. And so that's a that's a good one. All right, um, Athena, may I give you the the screen share for a moment and you'll do our medical home portal highlight? Yes, you can. Sorry. <laughs> Giving all the great buttons here. Okay. So when thinking about motivational interviewing, I wanted to highlight um, and, uh, where I think motivational interviewing is, is currently or um, sorry, I'm getting an error that Zoom quit. Is that true? Or are you guys still hearing me? We, we can hear you a little. It's a little fuzzy. Okay. Are you seeing my screen? Yes. Looks like you might be having some technical difficulties though. Oh, did she disappear? Yeah, she disappeared. All right, well, when she pops back on, we'll we'll uh, have her do that again. Uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm oh, back. Okay, great. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure what happened there, but okay. So in thinking about, like I said, motivational topic areas on the medical home portal that motivational air interviewing is typically used with. So for um, physicians and professionals section. And under our screening, find that there's a whole host of screening and prevention. Um, Athena, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but your audio is is not coming through very well. Uh, I don't know if maybe you want to shut off your camera and see if that helps for just a moment. And I, I heard you talking about our screening area where we do have a lot of actually great information. Hmm. I think Athena's connection is not great is what I'm getting, so. Maybe I can pick up on what she's uh, talking about. Let's see if I can override her. <laughs> All right, great. Okay, let me share my screen. Oh, there you are, Athena. Do you want to walk me through it? Yeah, so sorry. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so for professionals, and I guess it's just when I share my screen, for physicians and professionals, the screening and prevention, um, there's a whole host of topics here that walk through screening protocols, but then also what to do if a positive screen is um, identified. And this is where motivational interviewing can come in uh, really handy is when problems here are identified. And so um, I just a reminder that these tools are here. And then also within the um, service directory, again, if you feel like I'm not an expert in motivational interviewing, I don't know how to do this, but I want to refer somebody to that, you can also term search the word motivational interviewing. And that's going to bring up some service providers who either list that as an approach they use um, or uh, use it in their treatment. So just some um, ways to locate a few additional providers there. That's great. Thank you, Athena. That's super helpful. All right. Okay, let me get back to the PowerPoint. Um, I don't know that I am sharing that. Let me share the right way.
Okay, are you guys seeing the PowerPoint now? Great, all right. Okay, let's see if I can advance the PowerPoint. Here we go, ah, all right. So we just wanna remind you that the um, Division of Pediatrics uh, at the University of Utah is um, involved in the University of Utah's Pediatric Project ECHO. And so we have a few more sessions coming up in our fall um, series. Uh, we just did Differences of Sex Development last Wednesday. It was very interesting, very well done. So that uh, recording is available if anyone's interested in taking a look at it. Um, coming up later today, we have Emily Tyler from Shriners who will be uh, presenting on the child's foot and leg. Uh, on the 30th, we have exec executive functioning overview, um, which should be really interesting. Again, we're uh, very grateful to have Shriners providing that information. And then on uh, the 7th of December, we'll have our final um, informational session on transitioning to adult health care. And this one should be really, really good. Uh, we'll have Jenny Dopp, who is part of the Utah Parent Center and the Transition University program there. Um, who's pretty much amazing. We'll have Eric Christensen, who everyone knows and is equally amazing uh, with integrated services, who will also be part of that. Um, and I think it should be a, a very useful session. So if you're not able to make it, no problem. These are all recorded. They're typically posted the day after. And uh, we we it's just been such a fascinating um, educational series so far. I encourage you to take advantage of those um, those recordings. And then we'll finish up our, our fall session with infectious disease trends, which as we know, are hitting hard right now um, with Dr. Emily Thorell. And more information is always available um, on how to get in, in tune to those, uh, those pediatric echo sessions if you need, just reach out to me or to Michelle. All right. Wow, we're we're on track today. I'm excited about that. Oftentimes we get to this point and we're running a little bit behind, but we've got lots of time today. So I hope you'll uh, take advantage of that and and bring up any cases, um, old or new, that you'd like to talk about. Uh, any barriers that you're running into, um, they're really helpful for us to be aware of uh, because there are lots of folks um, on this meeting right now or that we're aware of um, who might be able to, to take a look at those barriers if we're aware of them. Um, additionally, issues, um, mm -hmm. ideas, uh, and new resources. And then, of course, if you've got any wins, we'd love to hear about those as well. So this is your time, and I'm going to be quiet. And if you'd like to use the chat, uh, that's a great way of doing it as well. Yes, this is Walt. And uh, just a plug for uh, Bicycle uh, collective. Uh, there was a news article uh, that came out recently that uh, they're actually going to get a new building, a 15,000 square foot, two-story hub. And here on part of the article, uh, it indicated that uh, it's a new $5 million complex just west of 300 West on 900 South. And uh, it says, when completed, the new building will include retail space, a bicycle repair shop for the public, space for professional mechanics, classrooms, and a place to store donated bikes. And, uh, you know, they've been really good to me. We had a family who had a teenage daughter, and uh, she was overweight, and she had a bicycle, and that was working out really good. And then, unfortunately, it was stolen. And when they found out her story, they actually donated a really nice refurbished bike. And uh, so just a, a plug for those guys. Well, thank you all. Yeah, it looks like they've got a, a drawing of what it's going to look like. That's fabulous. Yeah. That is terrific. Yeah, they are, they're a good organization, a good nonprofit. So this is the, the main one of them in Salt Lake, but they do have um, other locations throughout the state. And I've donated a few bicycles to them. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Walt. All right, anybody else? We don't have Tina from the Utah Parent Center on our uh, meeting this morning. Um, I have a feeling I know that she might bring up uh, some of the holiday programs. Um, I think she did this last time, 
Uh, do you recall, Michelle, that she was mentioning that it was going to be a tight year? Does that sound, I think? Yeah, yeah. I believe last month she did mention that, um, you know, it's just um, economics being the way they are, um, that uh, resources may be a little bit uh, harder to access this year. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if anybody's running into that or not. We do have some of those programs that um, will show up depending on how you search for them, I think. And Mindy, if you actually search the category, there is a holiday help category. Right. And you might need to remove your. Uh, yeah. 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 There we go. Yeah, so if you're working with families that might need a little extra help this year probably trying to connect them with things sooner rather than later would be the way to go. Hi Mindy, this is this is Eliana. I have I have um a question or advice that I need on a child that we have go for it so um I, I was glad to hear that um they have the spanish autism because definitely it's a spanish speaking that's having um a difficult time just getting the resources available like for her little boy but she asked us if um and i was going to go into the website but i'm sure like everybody else you know the challenges with staffing and stuff i haven't even had a chance to go into it but um the child has autism and she's looking for a place for the summer um, because the school um, last year um, offered a little bit of a summer program for him um, but they're not offering it for next year and she was wanting to know of a, a place where she can actually take them because you know, uh, physicians have told her that to keep him busy is the best thing, um, but she doesn't know where to go or where to start. Um, and I know I was going to play on the website, but like I said, it's it's been really hard. If anybody can help me <laughs> and send and shoot me some uh, uh, references or referrals that I could do, that would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to look to see because he's he's pretty complicated and. He gets um, really stressed out and then it makes things even worse for them. Um, but she's, um, I, and I really don't understand um, why, um, but she, they don't have insurance at all. Um, and okay. so that's been harder for them. Can you, can you remind me um, uh, where, where he's located and how old? He is um, 11 years old and um, um, has, has, let me see, a complex medical problem, including um, trisomy 18, mm. autism, global development, and cognitive delays. Um, lots of issues with stomach issues um, that she feels, or I think physician feels is related probably to stress. Um, but she's just having a heck of a time trying to get help for herself and for the little boy, mm. but she was just trying to think ahead for the summer of next year, because the school already told her that they won't be able to offer her any help at um, giving them even client classes during the summer. Oh my so goodness. She, she needed to get in talk, contact with somebody like earlier, so it doesn't book up, um, but I just- where, where are they located in the state? Um, they are in, let's see, let's see, in Salt Lake City. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I used to work for Salt Lake County Adaptive Recreation uh -huh. and they have adaptive summer camps. They have locations in Midvale and one in West Valley, um, it is for children that are age five through 21. Okay. Um, it does fill up quickly. So as soon as the applications are available, I would recommend she fills it out. Um, they typically do have staff that speak Spanish. So okay. they, they purposely hire individuals that are um, bilingual. Um, I, like I said, I used to work there. It's 
it's really great. Um, they do offer different kind of financing. Um, I, I don't know the details anymore because I no longer work there. So uh -huh. but I would recommend checking that out. That's perfect. That's a great place to start. Thank you so much. So sorry that she's struggling. She's obviously, um, you know, uh, thoughtful and, and organized kind of a person if she's thinking this far ahead. Um, is there anything else that's going on um, with her that that possibly we could brainstorm about in terms of help? Um, I'm, I'm not really sure. I was going to get more information from the providers. So I know that she's in and out of the ER a lot because of the child having severe abdominal pains and I don't know if it's a combination of uh, constipation that he has or the stress, um, but the mom gets pretty frustrated because it's it's she feels like you know nobody really gives her answers. It's just in and out of the hospital and coming and trying to get refills on things that possibly help her that she got at the hospital. And so I thought, oh, this would be a good person to try to help and try to get her like the resources that she needs to um, just to get help and know you know kind of where she's at and where she can um, get more help for her boy oh my gosh I'm so sorry to hear that well we definitely have some information um with regard to um constipation on the um, medical home portal uh let me pop it in here and it's here it's written specifically for families. We'll, okay. we'll put put that in the um, resources of the month um, meeting summary that we send out as well. And anything else that we might have on here. Um, I mentioned Jenny Dopp um, of Utah Parent Center. She and I sat next to each other at the transition um, summit event last month. And we were chatting before the meeting got started about um, something, and she shared with me an image that was really neat. Uh, I'll see if I can find it um, during this meeting and maybe pop it up at the very end. But it was a, you guys have all seen the feelings wheels, um, and this one takes it a level beyond that. So I think there's actually kind of three levels, and it talks specifically about what you might be feeling in, in the body. And I know that for me personally, I definitely have stress in my kind of my gut. So I don't think that it's out of the realm of, you know, possibility to think that maybe what's going on here is also emotional. Uh, and if this young man is complicated, he might not be able to, you know, express those feelings um, in that way. So I'll try and pop that up as well. Um, and do you re did you mention that she does not have insurance? Yeah, she doesn't have insurance, which is, uh, I, I, I feel really bad. Um, it, you know, she came in um, just, I believe it was the end of last week. And I, and I told her, I said, I'll look at all the information. I'm a little bit confused why she doesn't even have Medicaid. But again, it's just taking the time, you know, to actually talk to her and get some more information. Um, and, and um, Janet, um, which is my care coordinator, she, I had asked her if she had already researched it, um, but she, was, she ran out of time because like I said, we've been, we've been bombarded um, bad. Um, and so, uh, so we haven't had a chance, but I, I thought, okay, I'm gonna stay on this one because I wanna make sure that she's taking care of or at least given the resources. Um, right, to help right. Them her out. Mm -hmm. And of course, I, we can't go um, without mentioning Utah Parent Center as a, a resource that might be able to help um, them, uh, her with with Medicaid, if that's um, uh -huh. something that right. she's eligible for. So, yeah. so that's the part that I don't understand why she's not on that or somebody hasn't uh, recommended for her to get that because she's, I mean, she's really good about you know, wanting to pay, but you know, this last time she was, can I get on a payment plan? You know, and I'm thinking like, why, why are you, <laughs> why are you not on, on Medicaid? Cause I'm sure the child was born here. Okay. Um, so, um, so, but I, 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 like I said, it's, it's, it's a lack of time and I'm going to yeah. take the time right now to just take care of it. Okay. Well, please don't hesitate, Liana, to reach out to us separate from this meeting, if we can help you more. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I'll keep you posted. Uh, wonderful. Thanks. All right.
does anybody else have anything um, that they'd like to quickly bring up? I don't want to cut you short if somebody had a, a question or, or wanted to speak up. Okay, well, with that, then um, I'm very excited to uh, move to the next part of our our uh, meeting today. We've done motivational interviewing training a number of times um, as part of uh, UCCCN. Uh, there's never enough time to do it right. And we're very aware that everybody's so busy. So we are trying to take what is a complicated and um, really rich and robust uh, subject and push it down into less than an hour, which is going to be very hard to do. But we're going to give it a try. And we're so grateful that we have a couple of residents um, with us today, Dr. Spencer Merrick and Dr. Rebecca Powell, who are going to um, share with us what they know. And uh, so I'm very pleased to turn that time over to you guys, if, if that's all right. And I will stop sharing or I can do anything you'd like in terms of the, um, the screen share. All right. Um... Well, I will probably want to share my screen in just a minute, and I don't think I need permission to do that, but I'll ask. But can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Um, Dr. Or Becca Powell is on a leave of absence, so um, Dr. Yuji Wakimoto has been kind enough to hop in um, in her place, and um, he's actually um, uh, also done a lot of special training in motivational interviewing with um, we have a psychologist here at uh, HMHI who is fabulous and does a lot of training in motivational interviewing. Her name's Kelly Lundberg. Um, and so a lot of, honestly, this presentation is adapted from her. Um, but I'm, we're hoping to make it pretty interactive. And so I know, um, uh, I know how these meetings are and I tend to mute and, uh, and uh, close my uh, video as well, uh, just because it's easier to kind of multitask because I'm busy too. Um, I guess I would, st um, but we'll we'll give you a warning when there are some parts that are really maybe more interactive and maybe more interesting when they are uh, when we get a little more participation. But um, I at least want to start by saying uh, you guys are my favorite people in the world at uh, working in the pediatrics clinic. So we're triple board trained. Uh, we work in pediatrics and adult psychiatry and child psychiatry. Um, and in our pediatrics clinics, um, there are uh, a gazillion complicated, complicated cases that come uh, our way. And I would be toast without uh, you guys to help coordinate all the the really actually hard stuff and meaningful stuff uh, that is much more important than most of the stuff that we do on our side so so thank you for what you do um motivational interviewing let me see if i can share um and see if this lets me do presentation mode let's see all right. Did you guys follow me into that presentation mode? Yeah, okay. looks good. All right. Um, so we're going to kind of pass back and forth and do this a little informally. Uh, I'll um, pass this on to Yuji to start us off on our on our presentation. Yeah. So thanks so much for having me. Like a like uh, Dr. Merrick said, my name is Yuji. I'm one of the residents at the Triple Board Program here at the U. Uh, stepping in for Dr. Powell. Uh, so again, a lot of this slide is coming from the psychologist he mentioned, Dr. Lumberg. So huge shout out to her. And this is how she, she originally had these slides designed for use in primary care settings, targeting substance use disorder, which is why this, this quote was how she started off. But I feel like it's also relevant to us, you know, Quitting smoking is easy, done it a hundred of times. This is uh, Mark Twain who said this, Samuel Clemens, I guess is his uh, actual name. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of challenging things out there that we know that that would be good for us to do. Um, we recognize that, but it's just hard to actually do it. Um, and there's always some level of, um, you know, sort of this like, uh, like I'm kind of care, but don't really care. I, you know, I'm sort of in this limbo state um, and motivational interviewing, I think, is a great tool that we can access to, to explore that a little bit more. And so we'll move on to the next slide. And so with the outline today, um, we'll go over some of like the basics of motivational interviewing and, and we'll 
we'll we'll try to make it more applicable as, as possible. So so we'll explore certain techniques specifically that's maybe a little bit more practical and, and you guys can hopefully use and put into to practice. Um, as well as going through a case all together uh, as, as a whole group. And then if there's enough time, and I think we were hoping if we could break off into like small groups and do kind of a case separately that, you know, you guys can think about um, in, in like a smaller group setting and, and explore that a little bit more. All right. Um, so with motivational interviewing, um, like Yuji said, the, the whole purpose is not to um, convince people to, we're, we're not trying to, to play um, Inception, we're not trying to convince people to do something that they don't want to do, we're trying to um, work with their ambivalence and recognize that ambivalence and uh, resolve it. So if somebody um, very often our natural inclination when somebody wants help transitioning to adult uh, providers, uh, for instance, it might be that they recognize the need to do it, but they don't want to do it. And so our approach of um, throwing lots of facts and reasons at them why they need to switch to adult um, providers is, is our go-to, right? Um, but it tends to be ineffective because those are things that they often already know. Um, they're just ambivalent about that process. There's, there's kind of a, um, uh, both sides to that coin that they're, that they're not totally comfortable with. Um, so for instance, it's, it's not like uh, we're not trying to, if, if it's substance use, manipulate people to quit smoking, but have them really realize why they do or, or don't want to um, and explore that in, in such, de such depth that they um, uh, find that motivation in themselves. And these are kind of the core principles of motivational interviewing. So more of that basics of motivational interviewing we were talking about. Um, so expressing empathy. So we can do this, and, and I think a lot of us in healthcare already do this naturally, where we reflect back what patients are saying. We try to stick to asking open-ended questions, and this really allows us um, to to hear the patients clearly, and also for the patients to feel heard, um, which which is really important. Um, and again, another piece of motivational interviewing, like we said, is this result resolution of ambivalence. And so in, a big way to do that is to develop this discrepancy. So, so we want to understand where they're coming from, why they want to change. So, so we call that the change talk and, and, and what, what they are resistant to changing. So we call that the sustained talk. And a lot of what the, the skills that we introduce focuses on how do we get more change talk out of our patients so that they themselves kind of recognize like, yeah, this is why I actually do want to change these things and, and therefore resolving some of that ambivalence. Um, rolling with resistance. So I think Again, in healthcare, our our instinct is to to correct the wrong, you know, the the writing reflex. Um, hey, like it sounds like you smoke two packs per day and has been for like ten years. You should stop doing that. You know, it's really easy for us to kind of step in and say like, that's not right. Like, let's fix it. And really, the the key in motivational interviewing is again, and and this kind of goes into the next section of like supporting self efficacy. We want to engage with our patients and, and really try to maintain a neutral position where, where we're truly just wanting to understand the side of them that want to change and the side of them that don't want to, and, and really explore both those sections fully. And again, we're not trying to, to fix the thing for them, but we want to sort of promote more and more of the change talk out of our patients so that they themselves kind of recognize the importance and feel confident in promoting these behaviors. There's something um, about motivational interviewing that's so much less top-down than a lot of other types of, uh, uh, of um, therapy and other types of interviewing and, and talking with patients where it, it really comes from a place of humility where we're not um, assuming that we have all the answers. We're actually assuming that they have all the answers and that they are, that the answers, the best answers are in the heads of the people that we're working with. Um, and it really uh, goes a long way to actually go as far as to believe that um, because it actually is true uh, most of the time. And often if we do motivational interviewing from a superficial standpoint of um, trying to kind of manipulate them into, into getting what I want, um, we're not really going at it from the right place. We really do need to, to 
um, humble ourselves a little bit, which is kind of why I like this, um, uh, and, and come from a place where, where you know what, I don't actually have all the answers for my patient and, and what they're dealing with, and um, I'm going to validate and support them and, and roll with that resistance and, and see what answers they have for themselves. It's also a recipe for avoiding burnout, right? Because in, um, you're so often having conversations with parents who don't listen to what you are asking them to do, right? Or, or with patients who are not listening to what you're asking them to do. Um, maybe shifting the approach from asking them to do is, is a real good way to avoid that burnout and, and looking at a more collaborative collaborative approach. All right, so here are some um, of those practical skills that I was talking about in the beginning with motivational interviewing. Um, and, and again, a lot of these skills are going to focus on both reflection, so like making sure the patient feels heard, and also making sure that we, again, are maintaining this neutral position and we are hearing them fully. Um, and also, again, this thought of, of increasing the change talk out of the patients. Um, so the first skill is these double-sided reflections. And so this is a scenario where, you know, you're having a conversation with a patient, they're telling you their issue, they're telling you their concern, they're talking about the thing that they feel ambivalent about, you know, they're like, I, I know that I should, these things, but then also, like, it's just so comfortable to, you know, stay doing whatever. And so if, and, and, and this will come up naturally, I think, in a lot of our conversations. And, and when we summarize them in this, in this double-sided way um, and, and, and kind of say it back to the patient, even though they were the ones who said it to begin with, a lot of times they, they hear this in a summarized way and they kind of think to themselves, I never thought about it like that. Um, and, and so again, a lot of this. So on one hand, you know, Mr. Smith, like you are you know, you really enjoy drinking alcohol because this is an opportunity for you to engage with your wife in the evening. And, and you feel like this is a social tool that allows the family to stay cohesive. But on the other hand, you're noticing that like your amount of alcohol consumption is going up so much and, and, and you're starting to worry because your liver numbers are starting to get worse and what that could mean in terms of your health. So summarizing both sides, and again, maintaining that neutrality um, um, can sometimes really help patients recognize where they are at in that change versus sustained ambivalence. Um, similarly, the, the second technique, so just elaborating or asking the patient to elaborate more um, on, on, on the part where they're saying that they want to make change. Um, and again, just really digging down on, tell me why. Um, so in that earlier example, like, so, so tell Mr. Smith, you told me that one of the things you're worried about is this amount of alcohol you're consuming is leading to poor liver health. Tell me why that matters to you. You know, tell me the part of you that want to change because of because you're worried about your liver numbers. What does that mean to you? Um, so, so really elaborating on this and, and going down the depth to explore why this is important for the patient. And I like um, with that increasing change talk, this is where it really becomes less, <clears throat> a lot less passive. Uh, motivational interviewing is not just this passive experience of, of doing a lot of validating and reflecting. That's, that's critical to it, but it is strategic where, where we're choosing bits and pieces of what to bring out, you know, and, and that is where the real work is, where we're really emphasizing the change talk. And we're validating that sustained talk that I, I want to keep doing things how I'm doing it, um, but really kind of more pushing, um, uh, exploring uh, that change talk with the patient a little bit at their uh, at their pace, but um, but being strategic in how we're guiding them through that conversation. And this is another technique that's often used in, in the setting of motivational interviewing is is our use of rulers, um, and and. So if you, if you for, for some people might be, you know, also adept and experienced that motivational interviewing. And so I want to recognize that um, typically in the motivational interview setting, when we talk about rulers, we talk about the importance ruler. How important is this issue to you? The confidence ruler. You said you wanted to make a change. How confident do you feel about making this change? And then lastly, the readiness ruler, you know, like, like we've talked a lot about your confidence and the importance. How ready do you feel to actually take action? Um, a lot of the times, I think, uh, we're, we're skipping forward to the next slide, but <laughs> a lot oh, of the times- Oh, so sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. 
um, will will typically focus on just the importance and the confidence roller. And 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 sometimes it amazes me already how much that. Um, helps in terms of, again, promoting some of those change talk in our patients. And so the way we use our rulers um, is it, it, it's, it's, we follow like a three-step process um, as Dr. Merrick is working on getting the slides up again. <laughs> um, so, so it's a three-step process that, and, and I think I can keep talking about this without the slide. It's 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 not it's not super complicated, which is which is why it's nice. It, I think it's really easily applicable in a lot of clinical or even non-clinical settings. Um, again, so after you identify the thing that these patients feel ambivalent about, we then talk oops, bring up the the ruler. So we say, okay, we 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 use this thing called the confidence ruler, um, and I want to explore that with you today. On a scale of one to 10, one being like, you know, it's, you're not so confident or it's not that important to you. And 10 being like, yeah, this is really important or yeah, you feel really confident about like promoting this change. What number, ex you know, explains where you're at right now? Um, and typically when we say that, you know, patients will say, oh, you know, like, I don't know, depending on where they're at, but typically they'll say, any number between like a two to like an eight. I feel like that's like majority of the numbers. And then once you identify that number, the, the next step is, and you always want to start with why this number instead of like a lower number. Um, and, and again, when we explore that, the patients start talking about why this is more important to them than they, they, than they think, or, or why they feel more confident than they might realize when they compare to a lower number. And again, that's a way of promoting that change talk where the patients themselves identify the things that, you know, they're like, yeah, well, you know, like, obviously it's, 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 it's a three and not a one because like my liver health is important because I, I want to be able to live a good life. And, and, you know, I don't want to deal with all the medical complications. And they start talking about all the things where it's like, yeah, this is why this thing is important. And, and this is why I am actually not ambivalent. Like I want to change this. Um, and then the next step that, or then the last step you explore in the ruler is um, what do you think it would take you up to a higher number. And, and we don't go all the way from like, you're at a five today, what's gonna get you to a 10, you know? But but really just like one or two numbers above, like, hey, so you told me that you your confidence ruler is at a five today. Um, you know, you, you feel like it's not a three because like you recognize that this is a, something that you really care about. What do you think would you take it up to a six, you know, from a five, just, just like a, a notch higher. Um, and And a lot of the times, again, that promotes change talk, but also this can lead to, you know, I feel like I can work on these things to make this more important or more make myself more confident, which then leads to goal setting, which is another key component of motivational interviewing. The scale is a really good example of um, rolling with resistance, right? Where somebody who's you're, you're trying to get to be more adherent to their diabetes medication, um, to their to their insulin regimen. Um, if they say, yeah, it's like a two out of 10, I don't really care. Our, our inclination again is to say, um, let me go back here, is to say, oh, come on, it's not a two out of 10. You've got to care more than that. I mean, there's all this and, and this is, why, why is it a two and not, not a, a three or a four or five? That's, a, that's the natural gut inclination. Um, this is really kind of forcing you to do something strategic and the opposite and, and just find that little kernel of why a two, not a one. Um, uh, so, so kind of validating, hey, well, we got something to work with with there. All right. And I think this is the last one in terms of like an actual practical skill that we can use in our clinical setting um, is this thing called EPE or illicit provide illicit. And again, this is another way of avoiding that. Like we want to step in and say, hey, here's what I suggest in order to fix this issue. Um, First of all, so there's always a situation where you 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 do want to provide some information, right, to, to make sure that the patients are well aware of some of the issues that they're facing or like potential consequences and things like that. And you always want to ask for their permission before you provide that information. Hey, Mr. Smith, it, you were mentioning the, the liver numbers and, and, you know, related to your alcohol use and, and how that's worrying you. How much do you know about what these liver numbers mean to you? You know, say something about like, oh, I don't know, I heard about this thing, jaundice on TV. You know, I was watching House one time, whatever. 
Um, and then you say, yeah, you know, those are all really good points. Is it okay if I share you a little bit more what this means to have these elevated ASTs, ALT, ALTs, the, these liver numbers? A lot of times they'll say sure. And then you, you again, we've kind of started by already eliciting what the patients know, and then you provide that information. You know, in addition, when you have poor liver function, there's a lot of medications you're on that you won't be able to stay on anymore because a lot of those are processed with the liver. Are you aware of that risk? How does that make you feel? And then again, kind of ending with eliciting a response from the patients. Um, and again, goal there being always coming back to, wow, you know, I didn't realize that. That does raise my importance on the importance ruler. You know, that, that does want me to make a change. Um, again, elaborating that change talk. And this is just the, right, the yeah, no, sorry. Um, yeah, just like a resource that we included. Um, I mean, pretty easy link to remember, motivationalinterviewing.org. Um, but I think it, it does have a lot of good resources. It introduces all these techniques in a lot more detail. Um, it also introduced some other techniques. I believe it has like videos of, of like people actually using it in, in as like an, a practice or as an example. And so I think if, if you feel like some of these skills are, are maybe applicable. If, if you're maybe, maybe you're thinking about a patient or a family that where you feel like, you know, I feel like they are really ambivalent on that thing. Maybe I can explore that more with motivational interviewing, but I, I, I want to get more information about it. Um, this is a really great resource that, that does have a lot of um, accessible material. <clears throat> so we're going to go through a case um, and uh, Yuji is going to be the motivational interviewer, and I am going to be the patient um, who um, is expressing some ambivalence, and we'll explain the case um, actually before we go through it. So I, I'll, I'll skip ahead and tell you what we're going to ask you to do, and then I'll go back and read the case. So this part's a little more interactive, um, and, I, and I think um, this is just a, a way of keeping your eyes out for what we're talking about. I want you to listen for these motivational interviewing principles and skills and just type them in the chat. Um, and you'll end up typing the same ones more than once. Um, let's see, this is, um, sorry, one second. I think I've got the wrong version. Um, I've got two versions of this. And I am on an older one. Let's see here. Yeah. Well, Dr. Merrick is looking for that. Um, <clears throat> if it's all right, I'll just make a, a comment. And some of you guys on the meeting will have heard me say this before. <laughs> I'm sorry, I sound like a broken record, but I think motivational interviewing is such a great tool because as it's been mentioned, it can be useful in all kinds of settings. And I would encourage you to consider as we're watching the case presentation and learning about these tools today, how you might be able to use it in your own personal lives. Because if we're doing it there, we'll be even better in our, uh, you know, have those things more muscle memory. Um, I have two teenagers. Motivational interviewing techniques are brilliant for teenagers <laughs> because they know everything, so they will tell you, right? So if you do it well, it's a such a helpful tool for, for that particular demographic. <laughs> In child and adolescent psychiatry, I tell you, it's the... Um... It's especially something that you can incorporate in little bits and pieces um, into your visits, and it's it's something I use all the time. It works really well with kids, especially because there's so much invalidating that happens when we talk to adolescents and teens, and this is a way of of not coming from that um, that approach of I know the answer for you, and you're gonna play along. Um, so now I got it fixed, and I'm so sorry. Um, I clearly am tech illiterate um, at baseline, and this morning's even worse. Um, so as we're going through the, through the case, I want you to listen for these MI principles and skills and type them in the chat each time you hear them. So that means anything here, both the open circle and the closed circle, um, I want you to just, uh, just everybody as you can type them out. Um, does anybody, as you're looking at these, we, we've gone through, I think most of everything that's on here. Does anybody have some, uh, uh, um, 
is anybody unclear about maybe what some of these really mean um, about how to use that importance ruler or or what it means to have a, a content reflection versus an emotional reflection? Um, any any questions before we ask you to just kind of identify them as we go? All right. Well, we'll we'll just do it. So um, my chat does not work again. That's that tech illiterate piece. It's just not opening. So I'll trust uh, UG and everybody else to to I guess look at the chat. Um, <laughs> Does somebody want to read at least the, the case for us? I, oh, go ahead. Whoever said that? It's, it's Athena. Um, so Johnny is a 16-year-old with type 1 diabetes who presents for his endocrinology clinic visit with his mom. During the visit, it is noted that his A1C is elevated to 11.3, normally is less than 6.5. This surprises and worries his mom, who has been very supportive of his diabetes management. Okay, so that's the case. That's um, where we're going to start. I'm going to leave it on this screen as UG and I go through it um, and kind of uh, do a little bit of, of some back and forth here. And I am Johnny, and UG is the doc, and um, Dr. UG walks right in. <laughs> All right. Hey, Johnny. So good to see you again. How are things going in high school? You know, it's high school. I think it's OK. Um, I, I, I don't love it, but it's OK. <laughs> uh, all right. Yeah, high school can be pretty tough. Um, tell me how your diabetes management is going. Um, I don't know. It's going OK. I have um, I've got my pump and my monitor on and stuff. Yeah, OK. So let's talk a little bit about um, your A1C number. That's the number that tells us an average of what your glucose level was like over the past couple of months. It looks like our lab result shows your A1C was pretty high. Mm -hmm. I saw that. It was um, like 11, right? Uh, that's pretty bad. I don't know if it's ever actually been quite that high before. Yeah. Yeah. It, and can you think of anything that could be going on? I mean, I've got my pump with me always. OK, all right. Um, Anything that's been different the past few months specifically? Um, I mean, well, so I, I stopped, okay, so I stopped dosing my insulin for meals. Um, like I haven't been like correcting my carbs and, and stuff. Okay, that is different than before. Tell me more about that. So, um, like about the carb stuff, you mean? Yeah. Um, okay, I, uh, um, it's just, kind of a pain. It's hard to check carbs and hard to dose insulin, especially when I'm out with my friends. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I guess like a, a, a while ago, I was at lunch and I got called out while I was dosing my insulin at school. Like a friend like pointed it out and kind of made a thing about it. Um, and I just feel like if I, um, I already feel weird. And I feel like if I just don't do that anymore, I can kind of be a little more normal. Man. That's, that's really stressful. It is. It's, this sucks. So not dosing your insulin has been helping you kind of fit in more with your friends. What are some other things, like benefits, that you're noticing about not dosing your insulin as much? I mean, really, that's the big one. I just feel like less of a weirdo when I don't, when I don't dose it. Um, I, I feel like I'm the only one in school who does it. I've never seen anyone else with a pump or anything. Okay. So it sounds like dosing your insulin at school feels awkward for you. You can draw an attention to yourself that you don't want. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Tell me about any concerns you have about your current diabetes management. Well, so I know I'm not doing it exactly right in that it's not good for me. Um, and I guess I can tell on the days when I'm not doing great, when my sugars are high, because I kind of feel like trash. Okay. So on one hand, not dosing your insulin for meals helps you fit in. You know, you've, you mentioned you feel more normal like the other kids. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about being called out. Um, on the other hand, though, you realize that this, you mentioned this is not good for you. Um, and it also, sounds, it also sounds like some days you can feel really sick with this. Yeah, yeah, that's about right. That's kind of what I'm dealing with. Um, okay. And I don't know, I mean, both of those are, they don't feel good. Tell me more about, you mentioned this isn't good for you. Why is that? Well, isn't it like bad for my health to have like an A1C that's high is I guess what they say. 
Yeah. T- tell me more, though. What, why do you care about that? I mean, I guess I, I don't want to die. I want to live a long life. Um, I want to like go to college and stuff and get a job. Okay. So it sounds like your health is really important to you because you want to live longer, be able to accomplish some of the goals that you mentioned, like going to college or, or having a career. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I guess diabetes kind of makes all this pretty hard to do. Yeah, definitely. Johnny, you know, I'm going to introduce something called a scale. On a scale of one to 10, 10 being this is the most important thing, and one being like, you know, this, this is not a, it's not important at all for you. How important is it for you to dose your insulin for your meals? I mean, it's pretty important, probably like a six or a seven. All right, yeah, so six or a seven. Why, the, why those numbers in, instead of, say, like a five? Um, well, it's kind of like what we were saying. I, I, I know that it's bad for my health, um, and I do want to be able to live for a long time. Um, and be healthy and have a family and, and a career and all that. Okay. So I'm hearing that managing your diabetes is important to you because you want to have a healthy life, have a, have a career, family. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, a, like a good job. Um, and so I guess that's, yeah, pretty important. I, so maybe like a seven. Okay. Yeah. Bring it up to a seven. Good. Um, what would bring that number even higher? You know, like what would bring this from like a seven to an eight? Um, I don't know, uh, like make it more important. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, I guess I, if I get even more sick all the time from it, um, then it'd probably make it more important for me. Okay. So getting more sick all the time might make it even more important. Johnny, is it okay if I ask you a quick question? Sure. What do you know about having a high A1C, like these numbers that we keep talking about? You know, I'm not totally sure. I know that has to do with like my glucose, um, my blood sugar level, like all the time. And, and if it's like always in the 300s or something, I can't remember what you said last time. It, it just that it that it it means that my sugar is just kind of always high. Yeah. And can I ask, what do you know about some of the risks uh, that's related to these high numbers, like these high sugars? Um, I just it makes you feel sick. It makes you like puke and stuff. Um, I uh, it's like bad for your organs and your blood. <laughs> yeah, Blood vessels, no, I guess. That's totally right. Is it okay if I share a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like you said, you know, having these high sugar levels um, does raise risks for organ damage, kind of like what you were saying. It can really impact things like your kidney and your blood vessel. Also, some people don't always realize this, but it can really affect your eyesight. Like, this can really affect your vision. You know, you get like regular eye exams done, right? I do. Um, and I only just barely learned that that's because I have um, diabetes. I thought everybody got them that regularly. But yeah. 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 What are your thoughts about that, hearing that? I mean, it's bad. It kind of freaks me out to think, um, I mean, I, that I could like lose my eyesight, I guess. Yeah. So, Johnny, you said one of the things that would make dosing insulin more important is if you like if you noticed like how often you were getting sick or if you were getting sick more often. Um, and, and it also sounded like you do have some days where you feel really sick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do. Yeah. If it's okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about setting a goal maybe that, that's related to this. Can you think of anything that you can set as a goal that might help bring up this importance ruler like we were talking about? I mean, like I could mark down uh, on a, the days that I feel sick. Okay, yeah. So keeping close track of how many days you feel sick to have a better idea about how you feel. That sounds like a really great goal. How would you go about doing that? Can you think of like any barriers to you actually doing these things? I mean, besides the fact that I just am bad at keeping track of stuff, <laughs> uh, I'll probably forget some days. So I guess that's a barrier. Okay. Yeah. Um, what are some ways you might get around that barrier? Um, I mean, I guess I could, uh, I mean, I, I have a phone. I could put reminders on it. Um, I could like keep a journal or, or um, have like a calendar by my bed or something. Yeah. Okay. All right, Johnny. So, you know, I think I know we're, we're getting close to the end of our appointment time, but I just really want to make sure that I'm hearing you right. Okay. So let me kind of summarize some of the stuff that we talked about today and, and, and tell me where I'm getting things not, not quite what you feel like is, is going on. 
So it sounds like you stop dosing your insulin with meals in school or when you're out with your friends, you know, and, and, and not dosing your insulin helps you fit in better with them. You don't get called out at school, which can be really, really stressful. On the other hand, you're feeling sick on some of these days where you have high sugar numbers. And on top of that, you're worried about not being able to have some of these life goals if you have like impacts on your health because of this high A1C number. You said that it's pretty important for you to start dosing the insulin again. Like we talked about the seven on a scale of one to 10. And one of the things that would increase this importance even more is if you were more aware of how many days you felt sick. And, and it sounds like we set a goal of keeping a journal, sending a phone reminder to, to make sure that we're keeping track of how many sick days you have. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's that's pretty good. Um, that's, that's kind of what's going on. I mean, I want... Um, I, I want to figure this out. I'm, I'm feeling really pretty dumb at school, but but you're right that this is, I, I think this is something I want to work on. Okay. And Johnny, listen, I just want to say it's, it's been a really hard couple of years recently with the pandemic and everything going on, adjusting to high school. And I'm really impressed with your like desire to want to take care of yourself, you know? Let's see how it goes and, and reach out whenever you, if you need to, okay? Well, thank you, Dr. Yuji. And that's, that's, that's our example. Um, so we'll, we'll stop that there. Um, and let me see what the, the next scene is. Um, well, I guess any, any thoughts or questions on kind of how we went about that or, or any directions that, that Yuji took that were maybe different than what you had expected or, or what stuck out to you as something that maybe I wouldn't have gone about it that way, but I could see that this was more effective. Athena, did you want to say something? <laughs> no, sorry, I was doing a hand clapping. I hate oh. role playing, and you guys did a great job. So good job. <laughs> Thank you. What is it? I think it's called like suspending belief or something like that. We're we're told to do this during like our code trainings and things, and so mm -hmm. I guess I guess medical school teaches you to be a good actor. <laughs> And I just wanted to share, a lot of people did uh, comment in the chat. I know, Spencer, you said you couldn't pull that up. Nope. But I, I think all the, it, it's spot on with all the techniques that we were hitting on with this case example. So so thank you so much for, for uh, participating in that portion. Well, I, I noticed something, um, and I guess it's the uh, avoiding the writing reflex. Um, I so badly wanted you to have Johnny commit to dosing at lunch at school and you didn't go there you were okay with him taking a a baby step and and I was like wait <laughs> no he's got to do more than that and that's that was really something so I, I definitely saw that and and recognized that that would be something I would have to work on as the interviewer <laughs> Me as well. I mean, it's such a, a, a our tendency is it, we're fixers. That's why we in, in so many ways. That's why we are in the fields that we are in. Um, we're empathetic fixers, but we're fixers. Um, and uh, and it's hard to see that somebody is is really struggling and suffering and to not just say like, whoa, dude, you got to change this. This is um, this is not actually you feel sick, man. So so we got to like we got to get this. Um, but Johnny is telling you that he gets that. He wants to feel better. He's telling you that, um, and he's telling you how he can go forward. And and he is. Um, this represents change in the right direction, and it represents so much buy-in with his doc, um, where there's like he really feels like, okay, I'm going to go to that visit, and I'm not just going to be harassed the whole time for what I'm <laughs> doing and what I'm not doing. Um, I actually feel like he's in my corner, and he gets it. He gets that like this sucks to um, that that I feel like the odd one out. He gets it, and and that goes so far um, in the next visit. And it, and it may be that very next visit that you can actually like set those more tight goals, right? Um, but, but it is, it's, it's very counterintuitive. Um, these are kind of some of the examples uh, of how we explored the ambivalence. But I want to, uh, anyone else have any comments um, before, before I move on to the even more interactive portion of all this? <laughs> And I guess I will say, I, th I think in a, and, and, and Spencer, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in a, in a real world setting, you know, you're 
So, so I think your, your meeting with this adolescent uh, patient can focus on, again, being really patient-centered and hearing where they're at. Um, but also realistically, you're also talking with the parents and, and saying like, you know, these are some of the things that we can work on. And, and so I, I think there's a factor that's playing a role there where in a real world setting, I know that I'm not just talking to uh, a teenager whose frontal, you know, lobe is still developing, but also I'm talking to the parents who's kind of this like ultimate safety net, I guess. Because you're right, I don't want to like let this kid go and just have him have DKA at school and have to come to primaries. Like that would not be ideal. So, um, and, and, you know, I think, I, but I, I, I do, I do want to kind of like point out and recognize like, yeah, sometimes the steps can seem really small. Um, and, and some, maybe sometimes clinical judgment comes in where you're like, this might be a little bit more acute than, than, than the level of change we're talking about. And I might step in a little bit more. Um, but, but yeah, I think that's, that's the nice thing about pediatrics and child psychiatry is that you, you can also have parents as a resource, which is really nice. <laughs> And sometimes having parents as a resource, depending on the acuity, right? If, if safety is, is a concern, and we really are legitimately concerned that this kid's going to end up in the hospital with DKA over the next couple of weeks, um, sometimes that parent parental involvement is saying, hey, we've made some goals. And, and like privately talking with the parents of, we are strategically not pushing too hard on this because pushing hard has created some resistance and, and uh, uh, caused them to dig in their heels a little bit. And... And uh, we really are working collaboratively and, and making some, some good goals. So um, recognizing that parents have that same impulse, too, of, of I'm going to fix this. Um, I'm embarrassed that my kid has this A1C that's totally a reflection on me as a parent, and everybody's going to judge me, and so i got to fix this. Um, so, so writing the writing reflex of, um, uh, of parents as well, I think, is, is uh, sometimes pretty important. Um, how much time do we have, uh, Mindy? Are we uh, through to, uh, do we have until 10 or did you want us to close up sooner than that? You have until 9.58 and a half. <laughs> okay, that's great. Okay. You know, we, we were gonna, um, I just think logistically it will end up uh, fiddling with the, uh, well, it'll, because it's me. Um, I wanted to go into breakout rooms where UG was a patient and I was a patient. Um, but uh, so ignore this first part. Um, maybe um, maybe I will be the patient again, um, and we'll just do everybody together. But I but rather than especially because I can't see the chat, um, rather than have things commented in the chat this time, you guys are all going to act as the motivational interviewer in in, in your real role. Um, and so uh, and then I'll be the patient, and everybody just kind of popcorn in, talk over each other. However. Um, uh, and and we'll do the interview as a whole, um, and we'll this will be super informal. We'll kind of break character um, to to point out like some of these uh, strategies that you guys are using, or or point out how maybe maybe that's not an example of motivational interviewing, and how how maybe that's um, kind of the opposite, which is so easy for us to do the opposite all the time. So it's not so bad. Um, I guess let's use. Can someone throw in a real life case? Maybe something you're currently working on, or or have worked on recently in which ambivalence has been a major issue. Um, I, I know that you guys work a lot with um, uh, people transitioning to uh, adult care, and that, that can be really difficult because people are kind of comfy um, with their pediatrician, um, and, and that can be tricky. But um, whatever feels most relevant to you um, that we can use as a case and, and go forward with that. Anyone want to throw something out? I think someone will. I'm good at I'm good at waiting in, in awkward silences. It's good. <laughs> and, and how does this come up usually for you guys? Um, this is a training that you do pretty um, with some regularity. What are the situations in which you use motivational interviewing? What's the situation in which you have in the past? I know a lot of phone calls and a lot of um, check-ins, um, and some of those check-ins are, um, how are we doing with, with this? And, and there may be some ambivalence about whatever this is. Um, so, so maybe somebody um, who's brave throw something out.
I'm just going to jump in here. Sorry, we had a fire drill in the middle of all of this, and I'm going to just give you a funny thing. We've done motivational interviewing in this forum several times. Every time I have not been able to be here for the motivational interview <laughs> uh, workshop. So ironic that we had the, the uh, fire drill today. Um, I know that quite often as we work with families, uh, you brought up the uh, transition to adult healthcare piece. We do um, through our integrated services program. Historically, we've done a lot of health fairs, uh, district uh, district fairs, if you will, where we have a lot of uh, families and parents of children with, and youth with special health care needs who come through. And my sense is they're always looking for that secret sauce or that special pill that's going to be this time the panacea. That's the answer to everything they need to help their kid transition to adult living, adult health care. And we'll see some of these parents at the every single district, every single district health fair. And um, they're always looking for like a new answer rather than jumping in and, and like doing the work. And, and so I think with that situation is like, how do you really encourage parents to, to do the work? And I, I mean, I hate to, I, I don't know how to make it any more simple than that. You know, to say, gosh, you know, your kids, rapidly hitting that wall of 18 that's not going away anytime soon and we still haven't worked on these things that need to be done and i know parents are overwhelmed these kids are complex a lot of times parents are just you know trying to live day to day and you know that's that's the situation we frequently find ourselves and i think you can apply that to anything uh, i looked at your diabetes thing there my 27 year old has type 1 we dealt with that non-compliant kid always you know dealing with that so you know where you have complex health issues and trying to get that kid you know to transition to adult health care when the parents are really struggling with just trying to live life as well yeah i love it let's um i'll, I'll convert that into a real life example if that's okay and you kind of adopting a little bit of one of uh one of the cases that that you sent in your list mindy um Let's say that I am the parent, I'm the father of a 17 year old uh, girl with uh, cerebral palsy and autism and some intellectual delay. Uh, and she uh, has warmed up to her pediatrician and it has taken some time. Um, and we love the pediatrician. And um, so my name's Spencer, I'm the dad. We love the pediatrician and we don't want to transition to adult care we know that we have to um, and we know that there's some potentially benefits to doing that but we haven't really thought about that and the clock is ticking because she's turning 18 soon and the clinic has a policy in which like really they just they they're not equipped to and not licensed to um, continue to treat uh, my daughter until she's uh, when she's 18 for very long that's kind of like a an extra bonus uh, as, as we're transitioning here but this this is not sustainable and, and can't continue um, and so this is a phone call with me where we're talking about my upcoming visit and then um, and uh, you are the care manager coordinating uh, next steps and trying to transition me and, and help with that next next piece. And so um, so we'll we'll dive into it. And Yuji, you can be uh, as you can you can help out as well. Um, but uh, so I am. Um, I don't think that we're ready. We're on the phone. I don't think that we're ready yet um, for uh, for Trina to go to an adult doctor. She just really, really likes um, she really, really likes Doctor Brown, um, and I don't I don't think she's going to do very well with anybody else. So I just I just think we're going to uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. <laughs> we we need some. Lessons on how to keep our faces neutral. <laughs> <laughs> I know some thing to keep your eyes from rolling. Just hold yes. them still. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, Spencer, it sounds like uh, you all would really prefer to to not have to go through this change. Yeah, it would be it would be so nice if we could just stick with Dr. Brown. It's taken so long for Trina to get used to her and and to really feel comfortable. She's not used to anybody, but she likes Dr. Brown.
what's an emotional reflection that you guys could throw out there? It sounds like it was a hard time while Trina was was getting used to to Dr. Brown. It was. It was. And, and as you say that, it lowers my defenses quite a bit it, um, because I'm, I'm really feeling that kind of alliance with you. It was a hard time. Thank you for recognizing that. that this was just really, um, nobody really understands what it's like to, to, um, to have a kid goes into the clinic and, and screams bloody murder the whole time. And, um, you know, that's been our experience for years. And, and now she's, she's kind of feeling calm. So, yeah, it has, it has been hard. It would be great if you could just pause time for a bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. just, just keep her 17 for a while, right? We think that all the time. Um, we thought that when she was younger and smaller too, um, that would make things easier. And, and you know, of course, puberty makes things, um, introduces a lot of different problems and, and issues. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess it's hard because we, we view her as a kid. Um, still and and she kind of always in some ways will be our baby and and so it's weird to not have a pediatrician for her um so transitioning to adult doc absolutely yeah. um yeah i think another potential emotional reflection there could be spencer you're feeling really anxious about trina having to meet with a totally new healthcare system yeah, I'm scared. I'm I'm legitimately scared about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how might we like start to introduce some discrepancy, some some ambivalence? Because right now we're we're still we're doing great with that empathy and asking some open ended questions about it, and um, but it's time to start introducing a little bit of of that discrepancy, strategically. So would this mean like you could ask a question about how they would feel about um, meeting with a new a new primary care doctor? Um, not so much how they would feel about it, um, because we know how we would feel is we're nervous about it. Um, I guess what we see as the benefit of doing that, you know, so that's the discrepancy. Um, right. we, that's the ambivalence of, of what we see. And, and go ahead, Yuji. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, uh, that, I think that is a great question. And, and I think that's the part where, it, you know, it's, it doesn't come as easily or as naturally. Um, I think one of the things that you could explore is, is so earlier, Spencer said, yeah, you know, I, I know I should. I know the clock's ticking. I, I, know, I know I'm supposed to, you know, and, and say, you know, Spencer, earlier you said, like, you're you you know you're supposed to transition to an adult provider but like tell me tell me about that like you know like what what are your feelings about that what do you mean when you say you know you're supposed to well i know that um there aren't like that actually uh, she can't be seen in this clinic and and we're in a rural area you know there aren't really other places that um it's not like there's a specialty clinic we can't bring her up to salt lake um for for the home clinic or something like that is, um, and they're not doing virtual visits right now where we are. And um, so I, uh, you know, I, I know that it's like, whether we want it to happen or not, that it's going to happen. Um, and I know that it will be kind of the bandaid that we have to rip off at some point, no matter what. So on one hand, you know, you feel so comfortable with Dr. Brown and, and, and we recognize, we all love Dr. Brown. She's a great pediatrician. Um, on the other hand, you mentioned that you, you know there's a time limit to how long Trina can be seen at our clinic. And maybe the longer you wait, the, the more rushed the process is gonna be because you know there's not many resources in, in the community you live. Yeah, I mean that's really it. That's the that's the crux of it right there. Um, yeah, and I just don't feel like I just don't feel like it's um, it's worth going through that um, struggle right now. We've just uh, it's just not a good time. Ooh. <laughs> that's some resistance. Resistance. Um, 
that's yeah Oof, that's hard and to not roll with that would be what's the opposite of rolling with that what's what what is like the authoritative figure in you saying <laughs> you need to get off your butt right now <laughs> the clock is ticking dude and you're not doing your daughter any favors and um you got to do this now right that that's um and you could even say that in a soft way and it's still a confrontation so here's my you know like i said i've not been able to attend any of these so i don't know the thing to do but is it appropriate to ask is there a time that you feel would be better for you or that 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 would be a more appropriate time to address this issue i mean i know these families always you know want to wait clear to the last minute and the last minute will come and go so that's my question how do you address well that? and yeah it, it, and then maybe kind of hit that directly um of the last minute piece um what what might be some of the benefits of waiting until the last minute what might be some of the risks of waiting until the last minute you know that and maybe that's ultimately where we kind of focus in on the question um and and avoiding the yes or no question um that you asked but but using that same kind of concept and and turning that into more of an open-ended um of of what can um uh what can you do to uh to make it easier for you to do this sooner what what might make it easier to do this sooner instead of um do you feel like you should or, or do you want to do this sooner yeah I, th I think spencer brings up a good point just really digging down on the why and 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 you know you can keep you can really go deep with this like like spencer you said you said now is not a good time tell me more about that why is now not a good time yeah and I'll, and I'll say she's in the middle of you know she's a little bit acting out at school and she's she's um you know going to be in her school program for a couple more years and um yeah and and so I, I just don't feel like her behavior is is really easy for us right now okay so behavior at home is is, is a really big challenge for you and and tell me about why this this leads to you wanting to wait to transition to adult care yeah, I just saw the time and it's 9.59. And so oh. I'm, I'm so <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, the, uh, we, we got through just a small portion of it. But does that, um, I guess my hope is that the, the underlying concept here of, of really not confronting that um, it, it head on and not coming from the top and saying, nope, you got to do this and here's why. Um, it, and, and actually coming from a, a lot of empathy and a lot of um, recognizing that I actually do want to transition my daughter to adult care. Like I, I want to do that. That is also my goal. That is your goal. And that is my goal. You have to believe that even though I've said the exact opposite, that is also my goal. And I know that I have to do that. Um, and so that's a critical piece of all of this. Um, Cause you can come in and be really frustrated with me uh, otherwise. And, and we will butt heads and get nowhere. Um, anyway, and, that's, that's what yeah. I got. And, and I think, um, also, that elicit provide elicit technique um, can be a good one to to utilize if if you know like I don't know if the family is aware about how much of a crunch time it, this is and how much consequences they might face, but I also don't want to again come in and tell them paternalistically. So that's where that technique can be helpful too, where you say like, you know, you, you mentioned you know you need to transition. You mentioned now is not a good time. Like, is it okay if I ask you more questions about that? You know, and then being like. What do you know about the the specific time limit around this, or 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 what 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 do you know about kind of like the timeline of of how this process of transitioning to adult care works? And they'll tell you whatever paperwork they need to fill out, or or maybe they don't know anything at all. And then and then you can follow that up by saying, you know, like, is it okay if we explore that a little bit more? I just I just want to make sure that you know we we all are sharing the same knowledge base here. Um, and then again not telling them do you realize you need to do this this and then this and then you need to call this place that like but saying like you, you know here are the processes that's usually involved and and for a typical family it can take this much time for this to happen before you can move on to this next step 
you know, hearing that, how does that make you feel? Or do you have any thoughts about that? Um, again, that can be a way of maintaining that neutrality, but also making sure that you can let them know the things that you want to let them know. Um, so I think that's another good technique that you can utilize in that situation. Sorry, I didn't realize we were running out of time, so we went a little overboard with the last case. But um, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for having me here today. And this is a lot of, lot of fun for us. I hope it was um, helpful for you guys in some ways as well. Yeah, this was so, so great. And and those who had to hop off clearly have hopped off. So that's no problem. Uh, I, I know that we need more time for this. And, you know, you guys made it look so easy in, in your original case. Um, we do need to do the role play. I think that's what it comes down to. Um, and so it, we may ask if you wouldn't mind um, doing this again for us in 2023 or or some others from your program, depending on where you guys are, because and then maybe we could set aside even a little more time because it's clear that it's not as easy as it looks and it takes time. It takes time. So you got to probably do that practicing in order to hone those skills in the limited time you have in that visit. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things. For me to, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's great. And that motivationalinterviewing.org site I've been on, it is really useful. We'll, um, we always provide a meeting summary in addition to the recording of these meetings. Uh, so we'll, we'll make sure that link goes out there. Um, but, and, and if I could have a copy of your slides, that would be huge. Um, that would be very helpful. These particular, uh, cases are, and, and then of course, all of the, the detailed things about um, the MI technique, um, very relevant to this group. I think they'll find it um, really useful. So, Good. That, so wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And, and Dr. Wakimoto, we are so grateful for you to step in at the last minute. Um, you're clearly very good at this. And I'll, I'll just say that from the standpoint of the Utah Pediatric Community and UCCCN, we're so grateful that there are providers who, like you, are going to be triple board certified and available to the young people that we work with because there's such a need. And thank you for, for what you're doing. Um, so we'll let you go and I'll follow up with you afterwards. And then I'll just share the last couple of slides um, and uh, and we'll wrap up this meeting. So. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank Take you care. so much. They were great. All right. So for those of you who are still on, thanks for sticking around. Um, don't forget that we have that uh, email um, for our listserv. Uh, and you're welcome to use that or send me any questions you have and I'll send out uh, to the group. And then our next meeting is right before Christmas, but we hope you'll be able to make it de December 21st. And our topic is self-care. And these are always good, fun meetings at the end of the year. Um, so thanks everyone. And we'll we'll call it good and, and let you go stay warm. See ya. <laughs>